Okay, I'm calling this a review of True Detective Season 4, Night Country, uh, but it's not really a review, certainly not in the YouTube sense. Why? Because I'm simply going to say I give it a 10 out of 10. I think it's great. I think everyone involved did a great job. And I'm actually not going to go into the specific plot line, uh, like overarching narrative of any, not only the whole show, but not even a single episode. No, it's it's a great show. Watch it. If you don't get it, then, you know, I'm not going to waste time trying to convince you <laughs> or anyone um, that it's good. It should be obvious. My real intention here is to first confess that I am an absolute, just ridiculous nerd for this show, True Detective. And people are going to assume, I assume, uh, that they know what that means. But the problem is I have not met anyone who is as much a nerd for this show in the way that I am, right? There are nerds for anything with regards to just sort of trivial details, but there are nerds who obsess over the actual content and like the meaning and the overarching coherence and relevance and so forth of a, a work of art. That's a different kind of nerd. That's the kind of nerd I am for this show. And I have not encountered anyone, even on the internet, Right? Like, even, like, on Reddit and stuff. I mean, I'm not going to waste time searching, really. But I haven't encountered anyone who's even remotely as nerdy as me for this show. And the, the thing is, other shows, like, for example, The Greatest Show Ever, the greatest TV show ever made, hands down, The Wire. Right? I mean, I'm not, again, I'm not going to convince anyone of that. If you don't understand that, get with it, I guess. But uh, it's very easy to find people who are as nerdy about The Wire as I am. I'm a, I'm a total nerd for The Wire. I'm a, I love it. I just, I'm obsessed with how good it is and so forth. But it's easy to find understanding on that. Y you know, it, it's not like so easy that you can expect to find it in any given context, but it's easy to find. With, you know, and similarly with other great shows, TV shows, like, you know, like The Sopranos or whatever. I'm, I'm not into it, but uh, Breaking Bad or Mad Men or even, uh, uh Halt and Catch Fire, which I think was overlooked. I'm not. Get, I'm getting off on a tangent here, though. The point is, I'm hoping to find somebody, anybody, who is as hardcore a nerd for True Detective as me, and I'm going to describe basically the criteria, and I'll relate it to season four, Night Country, of True Detective. But um, I'm really just. I'm just kind of confessing to how much of a nerd I am. That's all this is. So I'm going to I'm going to describe three tiers and then an extra one, but three tiers of nerd for True Detective. OK, so we're going to start with some weak sauce nerd qualifiers. This is the weak sauce. OK, so like if you if you don't qualify for this, you're not a nerd for True Detective at all. That's the point. OK, but if you do qualify for this weak sauce, you're still a nerd for the show. I'm granting you that. But OK, some weak sauce would be like you've read The King in Yellow by Robert chambers and you understand that this re relates to the yellow king uh the the implied character or the entity the yellow king in season one like you that's you know exactly what i'm talking about cool some some more weak sauce would be okay travis cole rust cole's father who's introduced in season four right travis cole was evidently rose agnew's uh lover in ennis alaska as he, Travis, was dying of leukemia. This suggests a connection to Russ Cole's Louisiana investigations. Duh. And along with the revelation, I think, yeah, later in the uh, in season four, the revelation that the uh, Salal Lab is funded ultimately by Tuttle United. Tuttle being a reference to season one, of course. A very important one. Uh, but yeah, understanding that the Salal Lab is funded ultimately by Tuttle United, we can assume a conspiratorial connection between the technologist murderers of season four and the pedophiles of season one. Except who cares? That's the key. That's why this is weak sauce. <laughs> like, that's cool. I would love to meet someone like, you know, in public. You know, I'm out bird watching, and I'm like, oh, hey, uh, you know, chestnut sided warbler. And then the next person's like, oh, yeah, cool. Are you in a true detective by any chance? I'm like, yes. <laughs> And then they say something about Travis Cole and Rose Agnew and this relating to, you know, the Salah Lab to the Tuttle United. And then there's a conspiracy. And then Russ Cole was maybe, of course, aware of this, the full scope 
of the conspiracy at some level and blah, blah, blah. Should that occur in my life, I would celebrate, you know, immediately and, and for a long time thereafter. But this is weak sauce. This is weak sauce, man. Like, hear me out. Okay, so medium sauce. Some medium sauce nerd qualifiers. You haven't just read Robert Chambers. You've also read Edgar Allan Poe. Like, get out of here if you haven't. You're, you're like, get out of here. And then you've read Lovecraft, H.P. Lovecraft. I mean, if you've read all three of those, Chambers, Poe, and Lovecraft, and you understand how they relate to the overarching narrative of True Detective on the whole, medium sauce nerd. Medium sauce nerd. Again, like, I, I haven't even met a weak sauce nerd. So that would be amazing. Okay, so you've read Nietzsche. Also, this is some medium sauce level nerd stuff. You've read Nietzsche. You certainly read enough Nietzsche to understand the references to eternal recurrence, meaning time is a flat circle. Like, you actually understand what that means and how it relates, again, to the overarching narrative of the show, the philosophical underpinnings of the show. You understand all that, not just time equals a flat circle jokes, which is everyone I've ever met. Like, people don't actually understand what that means. They just think it's some goofy you know, metaphor or something. And it's like, no, it's a very terrifyingly profound uh, and specific idea in the philosophy of Friedrich Nietzsche. You know, and others, but most famously Nietzsche, of course. And the fact that Rust Cole's character refers explicitly to Nietzsche, I think at least twice <laughs> in the film. Um, It's like, or not in the film, in the show, <laughs> in the show. Yeah, you have to understand what that means, you know, to be medium sauce nerd, to be that at that level. I would love to meet a medium sauce nerd, but I never have. Okay, so here's some real sauce. This means, like, I legit think you are a true, true detective detective, right? You can be a true detective detective, but are you a true, true detective detective? Here's some qualifiers. You've actually read... Okay, you've actually read, you don't just know the reference, you've read and understand both Thomas Ligotti's Conspiracy Against the Human Race <clears throat> and his horror fiction. I'm not going to require all of his horror fiction, because even I haven't read that, That all of it. I mean, few people, very, extremely few people have read all of Thomas Ligotti's writings. But if you've read the core, like Grim Scribe and um, uh, Songs of a Dead Dreamer and others, like you should have dipped into others. You know, ideally some of the horror or the uh, corporate horror fiction and everything. You've read all that and you've, you've especially read Conspiracy Against the Human Race and you understand the, the underlying existential pessimism and antinatalist argument and you understand its relevance <clears throat> to the entire show. That's some real sauce level, like legit shit. OK, here's another one. You've actually watched the 1994 Franklin Conspiracy documentary. The whole thing, it's called Conspiracy of Silence. And you understand the season, th the season three reference and how it does, in fact, relate to season one and ultimately to the, the entire arc of the show. If you know what I just said, you are a real sauce, true, true detective detective. But here's the thing. I'm an extra hot sauce. True, true detective detective. Like, I, <laughs> I don't expect to meet anyone like me. And if I did, that would be so incredible because I would have relief, you know, like I wouldn't feel so ridiculously, I wouldn't feel so ridiculous in myself, like just in my obsession. <laughs> but here's, here's me, like here's some extra hot sauce level, true, true detective, detective shit. Okay. So, you know, you haven't just read Nietzsche and understand the references and the, the relevance. You want, you know that Nietzsche was actually a plagiarist of Philip Mainlander, when Nietzsche wrote God is Dead, which is not the explicit reference in the show, but that is obviously a given uh, preoccupation of the show, <laughs> the idea of loss of faith or God is dead and so forth. When Nietzsche wrote God is Dead, he was actually plagiarizing Philip Mainlander, who has a more explicitly existential pessimist expression of what that means, namely that the universe is the corpse of a god who killed himself. Okay, so you know that Frederick Nietzsche is a plagiarist of Philip Mainlander, and you've read Philip Mainlander. You, at the very least, know uh, his great 
magnum opus, you know, you know of it, uh, The Philosophy of Redemption, and you know that supposedly when Philip Manlander received the initial copies of The Philosophy of Redemption, his magnum opus, he used them as a platform upon which to hang himself from the rafters of his apartment. Okay, like, extra hot sauce, true, true detective, detective shit. If you know what I'm talking about, respect. Like, you are a fucking nerd. <laughs> Okay, so you not only know that, but you've read meta mathematics, so you have to be a nerd already, just in general. You've read meta mathematics, and you understand that time is not a flat circle. Duh, Nietzsche. Like, that's nowhere near a terrifying enough mathematical geometric concept. If you're going to make a mathematical metaphor, you got to go hard, man. So, no, time is not a flat circle. It is a non orientable meta fractal manifold of infinite dimensions, you fucking idiot. Plagiarist. Get it right. Okay, some other things. You've read Ray Brassier's Nile Unbound and... <laughs> like, who is... who? I've never met anyone who's read that book, period. But you've read Ray Brassier's Nile Unbound and... And I mean, I've obsessed over that book. Like, I've studied every fucking sentence of that, that fucking book. Uh, so you've read Ray Brassier's Nile Unbound and Breaking the Spell, a volume of essays, speculative realist essays, so-called, edited by Sarah DeSanctis and Anna Longo, and it has an interview with, uh, what's his name, Tristan, whatever his name is, I don't really respect him, uh, <laughs> and you've read Kent Mayasu's After Finitude, like, you've read this, these fucking books, and you understand them, and you understand the overall implication, like, you, you at the very least are aware that Ray Brassier wrote the introduction to Thomas Ligotti's Conspiracy Against the Human Race, and that Nick Pizzolatto plagiarized Thomas Ligotti informing the character Russ Cole... If you don't know what I'm talking about, when I say all, all of that, and that Ray Brassé also translated Kent Mayasu's After Finitude, and Kent Mayasu appears in Breaking the Spell, edited by Sarah DeSantis and Anna Longo, like, if you don't understand this lineage of speculative realist philosophers and existential pessimism, dude, get out of here. Like, extra hot sauce is not for you. And I'm not done. If you can match this, like, you, I, my mind will be blown. If someone can match me on this. Extra hot sauce. Okay. If you know that the Tau necklace, the Tau symbol necklace, worn by Steve Geraci, Italian name, is so in season one. I'm referring to something in season one. That this is associated with the Capuchin Franciscans, an Italian-based religious cult. They're a, relig a Franciscan religious order, a monastic order, a mendicant order. But really, they are uh, an Italian-based religious cult with a long history of, in particular, child sexual abuse. So you know, just to recap, you know the Tau symbol necklace worn by Steve Geraci in season one is associated mostly with the Capuchin Franciscans, and you know the of, if not the details of, again, like, I know the details, I know more than I'm going to say in this video about this, but if you at least know of the conspiracy in the Catholic Church to cover up specifically the human trafficking and child molestation ring run out of Milwaukee by the Capuchins under the guise of the St. Lawrence Seminary High School at Mount Calvary. If you know what the fuck I just said. Guess what? Extra hot sauce. Just You could take the whole bottle. But am I going to meet someone like that? I really doubt it. Okay. My only criticism of uh, True Detective Season 4, Night Country, other than that there's a few cheesy moments, but, like, that's totally fine. The only true criticism, really, the only like, legitimate criticism, is that the CGI in the very introductory scene uh, depicting the caribou, the suiciding caribou running off a cliff, that this CGI was pretty bad. <laughs> By contemporary standards, it wasn't very realistic. That's a totally legitimate criticism. However, who the fuck cares? Again, that's like, you're not... Pfft. If you think you're a nerd for that, for criticizing the CGI in season four, no, you're an idiot. The extinction metaphor of the suicide in Caribou is what matters in the scene, and its significance in the overall narrative far outweighs the deficiency in the CGI. Come on. So moving on. Uh, okay, it's the best season by far. Season four is the best season by far. Like, not gonna argue on that. So you don't need to wa you don't need to watch the first three seasons to appreciate season four. It's a standalone work of art. 
and you can't say that of any other season, you know, certainly no other season ends in a uh, artistically satisfying way. <laughs> They're all disappointing, like deeply and frustratingly disappointing. Uh, so season four stands alone in that respect. However, appreciating it fully does require watching the previous three seasons. Like, you know, that's no surprise. Season two, I'm just going to rank them in order. So like, obviously season four is the best. Obviously season one is the next best. Obviously season three is the next best. And then obviously and infamously season two is the most inexplicably seemingly awful <laughs> of all of the seasons. I'm not going to say anything about season two in this video, though. It deserves its own video. It's a special thing. I'll just say that much. So I'm only going to talk about three nerdy details from season four. And if anyone can match me on these, like if you're aware of all of these, that would be pretty freaking awesome. But it's still, I would say it's medium hot sauce. Like I'm, I don't even get into, you know, extra hot or like even real hot sauce in these. I certainly don't get into extra hot sauce. These are all like medium level. But if someone can match me on these, that would be amazing. Um, okay, so Ferris Bueller's Karaoke Twist and Shout. Twist and Shout is by the Beatles. But the video reference in season four at the Salal Lab playing on the TV in the rec room or whatever. Uh, the Ferris Bueller's karaoke version of Twist and Shout sung during the September 28, 1985 Chicago Von Steuben Day Parade. This, okay, it's important to understand that this isn't just hinting at Detective Danvers' troubled past and her maternal grief. Like, if you realize that, congrats. Again, you're not even at weak sauce level. You're not a nerd. You're just pointing out, you know, you're capable of like a high school level understanding of narrative structure. You know, I mean, that's cool. But like the point, really, the deeper point is that what does this represent not only to Danvers as a memory, but sim like the content of the reference, which, by the way, is playing on a loop inexplicably. Right. Like this as if. The, only that scene is playing, right? And I won't, I won't get into all of the implications there because there is, uh, again, a, an eternal recurrence kind of metaphor there, which you'd have to, you'd have to be medium level nerd to even understand. Um, it's not just about that, the, her troubled past and the maternal grief. Rather, this, this scene, this Ferris Bueller singing Twist and Shout at the, at the Von Steuben Day Parade represents unbridled joy social harmony, racial harmony specifically in the scene, people of all ethnicities are, are singing and dancing in harmony and peace. It represents German American harmony. So like an end to Nazism, basically it's a vision of paradise, of happiness. It's a vision of heaven basically is what this scene obviously represents. It's so happy, right? It's so beautifully happy. It's a famously joyful, scene in a movie and detective danvers is basically say saying shut the fuck up and she violently shuts down this scene whenever she encounters it in the solo lab she doesn't just say turn that off she's like fucking turn this shit off what does that mean though aside from her maternal grief and everything it's an expression of existential pessimism folks obviously well i mean hopefully you would think obviously but we'll see Re meaning what the Ferris Bueller reference represents optimism and Detective Danvers shutting down in a violent, obviously depressed manner, <laughs> shutting down this reference, uh, represents, ex represents pessimism in a nutshell, like existential pessimism, meaning like profound, actual pessimism, not just bullshit. Okay. I encountered, a, uh, an internet nerd who thought they were pretty nerdy. And they were referring to the Thing DVD that's shown on the shelf while the Ferris Bueller DVD or, or video or whatever, while it's playing in the Salah Lab. They pointed out the Thing and pointed out that research scientists are hunted in an Arctic research station in that movie. So, yeah, that's some nerd. That's, I would say weak sauce, maybe. Maybe that's weak sauce level. It's barely even weak sauce, though, let's face it. The real point here is the analogy to love H hb lovecraft's at the mountains of madness okay so the real contrast is between ferris bueller's karaoke twist and shout during the 1985 chicago von steuben day parade 
which represents optimism, and H.P. Lovecraft's At the Mountains of Madness, which represents absolute cosmic horror pessimism. Okay, that's important. So moving on to, that's number one, this is number two. There's a film lineage that's important to understand with season four, and that film lineage doesn't involve the thing. <laughs> no, the film lineage goes from Bergman's Winter Light. If you haven't seen Bergman's Winter Light, go see it. That's the film number one. It basically is an expression in this lineage of nuclear era pessimism, like existential risk around uh, the nuclear bomb and global war. And the focus of the narrative really is on suicide, like a loss of faith and, a, and that leading to existential despair and that leading to suicide. That's the darkest thing in the narrative is the suicide of one of the characters. So it's an individual suicide, though. Okay, so the next film in the lineage is Paul Schrader's First Reformed. Far later, I think it's 2015. I think Bergman's Winter Light is something like 1965. I'm not sure offhand. I didn't write it down. But Paul Schrader's First Reformed is the next in the lineage, meaning it's darker. <laughs> it's more. It's existentially darker. So suicide is part of the narrative, individual suicide and individual s despair. However... The despair is now focused on climate catastrophe pessimism, meaning a species-level suicide is the real point of that narrative, or at least it's one of the themes. And then we finally get to season four, Night Country, where species-level suicide is just the intro detail. The caribou suic suiciding themselves over the, the cliff is an obvious reference, you know, a seemingly obvious reference, at least in hindsight, once you've seen the show to the, ex the extinction of the human species. Um, and then Julia, uh, Navarro's sister, her younger sister, Julia's heartbreaking suicide narrative is actually just a sideline story in a sense. It's, actually, it's just something happening in the background of Navarro's life that's informing her character development. <laughs> I mean, it's a significant part, obviously, of the, of the narrative, but it's not the most depressing thing <laughs> by a long shot. Rather... The most horrifying thing in the show isn't even the murder sequence, which is, again, like, heartbreakingly, deeply disturbingly terrifying. But the real terror in this narrative is eternal recurrence being very possibly real, not the hallucination of some idiot pedophile, which is where it's brought up in season one. Also, Rust Cole, while talking about it, is just a drunken idiot played by Matthew McConaughey. It's not serious. <laughs> it's not something you take seriously. However, in season four, there's a very like compelling depiction of the idea that eternal recurrence is at least possible. It's at least possibly real, which suggests absolute pessimism, not just individual level depression or, or individual level suicide even, but absolute cosmic pessimism. And here's the real, the real novelty, or like the real, uh, let's say, advancement represented by season four, Night Country. It suggests by the end, without telling anything about the narrative, it suggests by the end that suicide is very possibly good. Okay, this is the implication of Navarro's final character development in the finale. We don't need to get into what exactly it is or what happens, but the idea there, let's face it, is that you can die happy via suicide. <laughs> It isn't, it isn't conclusively uh, revealed that Navarro commits suicide. It's implied that she, may, she might have. And within that implication is the idea that you can die, that she would have died happily. Right? That suicide isn't necessarily sad. It could, in fact, be happy. Which, on one hand, is, depending on how you look at it, deeply disturbing. And on the other hand, extremely healing and inspiring. And actually, a, a like a loving very deeply human, beautiful idea to communicate in a work of art. Like, it's pretty amazing. So one way to look at this lineage is that it, it progresses in darkness. You go from winter light to literally winter darkness. In season four, Night Country, you, you, the context is, of course, winter darkness. That's the whole context. Uh, so you go, you, you go into the abyss, you know, so deeply. You stare so deeply into the abyss in this lineage through season four Night Country, it's so dark that you actually come out the other side and see light at the center of the abyss. You know, you find the light at the end of the tunnel, as it were. 
and this is actually healing and inspiring. And it's what I would call radical depressive realism. It, it, it's the advancement from pessimism to legitimate realism. Pretty fucking cool. Okay, that's number two. Here's number three. This one's pretty simple. The spiral. The spiral metaphor, the spiral image in season four. It relates to season one. It relates to the overarching theme of, uh, of pedophilia and pedophile symbols and like cultic symbols for secret you know, organizations that are up to no good kind of thing. But the the deeper implication here, of course, is that that conspiracy represented, say, in season one and in Louisiana and the implication of season three referring to the real Franklin child pedophile conspiracy. The implication that the, the spiral's implication is that it extends beyond even that. However, the, it it implies further that uh, the spiral refers really to just evolution itself, right? Like there's a scene where a whale skeleton, I think it's a whale skeleton, um, is in the form of a spiral frozen, or yeah, frozen into ice. There's a deep metaphor there that the skeleton represents evolution, basically, or ev the evolutionary process, the the history of life throughout the universe, that kind of thing. Okay, so a spiral has this feature, which is a positive or negative chirality or left or right handedness. It's, it's directional. So metaphorically speaking, this is the difference between a vicious spiral, a negative spiral and a virtuous spiral or a positive spiral. Okay. So the vicious spiral obviously represents madness. Junji Ito, the incredible genius, uh, manga artist, Junji Ito, you know, he repre he expresses the idea that the vicious spiral symbolizes madness more beautifully and 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 operatically than anyone in his masterpiece Uzumaki. So check out Junji Ito's Uzumaki if you want to delve deep into nerd like hardcore nerd obsession with the idea of the spiral itself of the vicious spiral specifically. Okay, so like season 4 Night Country implies ultimately that evolution is itself the evolutionary process is itself a vicious spiral. So it's referring to the inevitability and inescapability of extinction and the futility of life. <laughs> right? But there's a such, there's such thing as a virtuous spiral, and this is also an implication of season four. The virtuous spiral would suggest healing, recovery, enlightenment, peace, and so forth. Importantly, there's the same underlying structure. There's the same underlying topology here. It's, a, it's the same spiral structure, but it's just viewed in the other direction. Right, and that's a deeply philosophically important idea um, in season four, Night Country, and really throughout the whole series. So I'll just end by saying that I don't expect this to happen at all. But what I would like to happen ideally is if um, is, if there are to be more True Detective seasons, it would be awesome if Nick Pizzolatto and uh, Isa Lopez who's the master behind uh, season four. It would be awesome if they collaborated. And if they collaborated specifically by assuming different roles, those roles being specifically that Nick Pizzolatto would be responsible for the setup, the pitch, and Isa Lopez would be responsible for hitting it out of the park. <laughs> because I think that's exactly <laughs> what has happened with, Nick Pizzolatto in the first three seasons of True Detective and Isa Lopez with season four. Isa Lopez is obviously better. Like, in all, like all things considered, she's obviously a better, like, filmmaker or showmaker. Uh, she's a, she, she is capable of expressing a coherent narrative structure that's also compelling, also mysterious and intriguing, but which is artistically satisfying in its conclusion. That's the big thing that was missing from the first three seasons. And I, I could go on and on about... This is the thing, like, if you don't understand the reasons why the first three seasons of True Detective are disappointing, you're not even a weak sauce level nerd. That's the thing. It's like, you have to understand that Rust Cole would not say the things he says <laughs> in the finale of season one that it makes no sense that it's a total, like, bizarre cop-out in some strange way, you have to understand... I won't even get into season two. I mentioned I'm going to do a whole video 
upon just that. But uh, you have to understand in season three, at the very least, that the ending is absurdly pointless, basically, from a narrative perspective. It's just it's just a, a total waste of the entire show. Like, everything that was interesting about the show, everything that had tension, the tension is just completely deflated. It's not interestingly settled into some other kind of tension, you know, which would be a, a, the correct way to end the show. And you have to understand that the reference to the, the Franklin... Uh, I mean, well, the reference to Rust Cole and uh, I forget the other detective's name because no one cares uh, <laughs> in season one. The reference to that in season three is not followed up in the way that it would have to be. It would have to have been followed up in that case. The references in season four to pre to season one don't have to be followed up. They did. They're exactly what they should be. Uh, but in season three, the references to season one were needed to have been actually related to the narrative. It that's what's supposed to happen, very obviously, <laughs> and it just didn't happen in a way that wasn't interesting. It was just disappointing. And then you, if you're a medium sauce level nerd, you'd have to understand that the reference to the Franklin, the 1994, or rather, the you know the 1994 Franklin uh, conspiracy of silence documentary, at the very least, and then the underlying. Uh, Franklin pedophile ring, you know, scandal slash conspiracy slash conspiracy theory, that whole thing. You'd have to understand that the reference to that not being followed up is extremely disappointing as well. I mean, it's like even more disappointing. Um. Anyway, I'll just end it there. This is how much of a nerd I am, or at least this is a glimpse. <laughs> like, surely this is only a glimpse. <laughs> Into how much of uh, a specific nerd I am for this show. And I, it would be amazing if someone in the comments who's not a robot, right? <laughs> like, you have to convincingly not be a robot. That's the other thing here. Uh, that someone is as much of a nerd as me. Like, the fact that ChatGBT can be made into as much of a nerd as me on this is not satisfying, right? That's not what I'm looking for. So, uh, if anyone's out there, you know, here's here's my message in a bottle. <laughs> 